All right, and we're recording. At least that's what the machine says, and the machine is always right. All right, so I'm happy. Thank you. Thanks again to everybody for joining another one of my uh, videos where I interview people who are a lot smarter than I am to tell me about things that I don't know and hopefully uh, learn something in the process. I am excited today because I've got two people for the price of one, and uh, one of them has a, a bum computer, so we're, we're ganged up here around a single computer. And, and that's fine. This will be a first. I've never I've never had to do this, uh, but it might be kind of it might be kind of interesting instead of having all these remote people and screens. We have them right in front of me. All right. We're going to just to get well, who we have is Dr. Aaron Riches and Dr. Andrew Yeager, both who teach at Benedictine College in uh, Kansas. Atchison, right? Atchison, Kansas, right. I yeah. do believe. Uh, not too far from my hometown of Lincoln, Nebraska. So I'm going to give a brief. Oh, by the way, to my viewers. Uh, if I do have my dog with me today, he has not been sequestered. Leo, the wonder dog is sitting over here. He's a border collie. He's currently sleeping. But if he does happen to bark at somebody, a leaf blowing down the street, <laughs> please, please don't be alarmed because he's here. Well, I'm going to begin with uh, Dr. Aaron Riches. Uh, I just I just ripped this off the Internet. Holds a Ph.D. in theology from the University of Nottingham and master's degrees from the University of Virginia from the Pontifical John Paul II University in Krakow, and from York University in Canada. Before joining the faculty at Benedictine College, he taught theology at the Archdiocese Seminary in Granada, Spain, where, by the way, you probably know my friend Michael Taylor. That's right. Um, so yeah. where he was also a faculty member of the Instituto de Filosofia Edith Stein. He has published in various academic journals and is the author of the book Ecce Homo, on the Divine Unity of Christ, which I have have read, and it's great, and I highly recommend it to everybody. It's still in print, I assume. Is it not, yeah, Dr. Yeah, Richard? In print. Now, in, right. the, in the age of uh, print on demand, nothing goes out of print, so everybody can say <laughs> my book is still in print. I assure you, I assure, <laughs> I assure you that my books are most likely never going to see print again. So, uh, uh, I thought I thought my my last book on science and religion. Um, called the the god of covenant creation or some fancy title that means nothing i think it's still in print but i'm not certain anyway uh then the the other guest dr andrew yeager lives in atchison with his wife oh by the way dr aaron riches lives in atchison as well with his wife and five children and then six, dr seven. andrew what's that yeah, you're gonna have to update that larry yeah. it's there's seven six, now there's six kids no just six just six. Six. Just six all I'm right not going, i'm six. not going higher than six well, the interwebs have better. You you have got to inform your uh, college there to update the interwebs. Okay, it says five, all right. So you have six, all right. Doctor Andrew Yeager lives in Atchison, Kansas, with his wife Catherine and his children. Uh, he he has, according to this, one, two, three, four children. Is that still accurate too? <laughs> that was that was that was some time back. Uh, seven. Seven. You're oh, better than me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, six and seven. All right. He received B.A. degrees in theology and philosophy from Benedictine College in 2008 and his M.A. and Ph.D. in philosophy from the University of Nebraska, Lincoln, my hometown. I spent a freshman year there majoring in philosophy. One of my philosophy professors committed suicide. I remember that. He had the audacity of jumping out of Old Father Hall on a football Saturday. Uh, Hardy Jones was his name. Oh, I shouldn't say that publicly and shame the man. He was actually a great guy. I admired him greatly, and I was very sad at his passing. But he, um, anyway, back to Dr. Yeager. Yeah, he was named the 2013 American Catholic Philosophical Quarter's Rising Scholar for his paper, Back to the Primitive, From Substantial Capacities to Prime Matter. Dr. Yeager has published papers on metaphysics and theology in several journals, including Comunio, American Catholic Philosophical Quarterly, Journal of Analytic Philosophy, and Res, Philosoph Res Philosophica. He is currently working on a book on the metaphysics of Plato, Nietzsche, and Dostoevsky. All right, so introductions out of the way. All I have to say is that's very impressive, gentlemen, so I'm very happy to have you both here. Uh, we do have a common uh, interest, I, I believe, in, in the theology and philosophy of Hans Urs von Balthasar. And that was the, one of the first things that sort of piqued my interest in, in having these guys, because I'm obsessed with all things Balthasarian. So I'm going to, uh, we, we discussed off screen before, what are we going to talk about? And, and basically Plato, Hegel, Balthasar, or anything else in between. So I, I want to start with Plato. And 
I'm not going to address it to anyone. In spe- whichever one of you wants to speak up first can speak up first. Uh, let me just say, Balthazar is often accused uh, by some of his critics, but heck, even by some of his admirers, of when he retrieves a philosopher or any thinker, that he does so often, quite often, very idiosyncratically. <laughs> that He gives it a sort of, in other words, he's not, inaccurate but it's it's such a balthazarian reading of a thinker uh that he is sometimes accused of forcing a thinker through a certain lens now i'm not trying to prejudice the conversation from the start but let's 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 start with that question um how does how would you characterize balthazar's retrieval of, of plato and 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 what in a sense do you think he's doing with plato why why does he think plato is important Wow. Um, well, I mean, I think that the, I mean, I think one thing that, to say is that maybe a real thinker um, is using uh, another thinker, um, not in a way that betrays them, but uh, is, is using them to answer or, or provoke questions um, of, their, uh, of, their, of their own posing in some sense. I don't know. Maybe like, I mean, I studied with John Milbank, so I mean, uh-huh. John John's accused of this kind of thing all the time, but it seems to me that like an overly uh, faithful rendition of a thinker sometimes uh, gets 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 trapped in a sort of uh, it, get, it, get, it gets it, it gets trapped in, in a kind of uh, a, a narrow retelling of the of the thinker. The thing with Balthazar, I guess, with Plato in particular, I would say that the 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 place where I mean I'm not I'm no Plato scholar I mean I, I'm not even a Balthazar scholar I'm barely I'm I'm, I'm barely a theologian but the um, <laughs> the 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 interest for me is in the the, the question of uh, of beauty and in the you know in the the prologue yep. into a theological aesthetics Balthazar there is certainly using Plato Plotinus a sort of pl- uh, Platonic um, idea of, 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 of beauty, uh, but he's finding where it fits concretely already in the, in the Christian, um, in the Christian retrieval of these things before him. So, I mean, in his definition of beauty, the, you know, the unity of uh, uh, the splendor of form and light, I mean, that, that, that's in, in Aquinas, it's in a lot of other places. It's certainly also in Plotinus. We were talking about that in some, a couple of classes recently here. Um, uh, Andy and I, and then I think uh, I mean the idea in Plato of, uh, in particular, of beauty being the form that descends the lowest, right? And right, and right. so so, I mean I don't think that he's trying to be faithful or unfaithful. I think he's using uh, Plato uh, in in his search for the truth, which here is you know a, a recovery of the transcendental of beauty. Yes. I agree. I agree with that. So that means it's correct. Uh, <laughs> it means it's an absolutely correct answer because it agrees with my view. I've, I've never quite, and, and I've read Milbank and I understand that the, some of those criticisms are leveled at him as well. And they are criticisms that could be leveled at any truly uh, creative thinker. I right, think because, right. the, you know, they're, they're trying to retrieve the past, not slavishly to right. just, you know, uh, to engage in a kind of platonic fundamentalism. Well, this is what Plato said, therefore, uh, right. But but to, in a sense, tease out of a Platonic system bits and elements uh, that can be then reconfigured uh, in, in new and innovative and creative ways. Uh, and, and I and I see that as what Balthazar does, not just with Plato, but with, but with a whole range, a whole range of, of, of thinkers. Yeah. Um, now, Dr. Yeager, you, you're the philosopher here amongst the three of us. If if. If uh, Aaron's barely a theologian, I'm barely a philosopher. So. <laughs> now, come on, you got your doctorate from the University of Nebraska, which means that you are probably a Wunderkind of some kind that uh, knows philosophy inside and out. Uh, but anyway, what? And, and keeping on the on the theme of Plato, mm-hmm. and I I don't know what your particular philosophical you know school of thought is or what your philosophical orientations are. I suspect they're not in the realm of analytic philosophy, are they? That was actually my training, uh, grad school, uh, Nebraska, heavily analytic. So I wrote my dissertation in analytic metaphysics on um, composition. Uh, but since, I mean, last, I'd say, five or six years or so, I've been, I've been mostly sort of researching on uh, Plato. 
Okay, well, let's okay. Let's the reason why I asked the question is because I know, having been there, but I wouldn't I wouldn't identify myself as an an analytic philosopher uh, uh, per se. I learned a lot, um, but I think I think there's some presuppositions in what philosophy means and what philosophy is, and the ends of philosophy made in analytic philosophy that, um, or, or even calling it analytic philosophy might be a little too um, uh, uh, sort of rigid. But sort of that spirit, uh, if you will, of, of philosophy, I, I don't, I guess, subscribe to. So, for what it's worth. Well, that that, that that's interesting because I, I, the reason you know, the, the reason why I brought the question up, I noticed that you had published in, in a journal of analytic philosophy, and I know that UNL uh, leans analytic in, in among many of its professors. So I figured, mm -hmm. okay, well, he's probably got some analytics in his in his background. Um, but the, and the, but I'm not just asking that to ask that. It, 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 I, I always find it, it seems to me that Balthazar clearly leans in the direction more of continental thinkers. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, unless I'm completely unaware of it and ignorant, I don't think Balthazar deals specifically with analytic thought anywhere in particular, does he? I'm, Do you I, know? I'm, I'm, I don't I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's it's usually sort of the the, the German idealist. Uh, yeah, sort of branch though. He's yeah, he's all obsessed with the German idealist tradition, the Romantics, yeah. uh, and and I I can't remember call him ever dealing with analytic philosophy. I would just say this about analytic philosophy before we move on, which is that I uh, I I I'm sure it has merit. I'm sure it has value. There's a reason why it's out there, and there's a reason why people find it <laughs> useful uh, to them and so forth. But I have tried my I've taken courses in analytic philosophy. I've read books on analytic philosophy and i find it so impenetrably boring that i'd rather gouge out my eyes with knitting needles over and over and over again <laughs> than than do analytic philosophy <laughs> it, i just thought it was so soul killing but then i thought well you just mu must be stupid because a lot of really smart people really put a lot of stock in in this stuff um but but I don't know. I, I'm not expecting you to comment on that. Uh, but but that can, that can I, can I comment what, on it? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, so one of one of the works that really helped me um, in my sort of development of what what the point of philosophy is, which I mean, this this also ties up with with Plato. Uh, but it was the um, sort of the work of uh, uh, Pierre Hadot on uh, philosophy as a way of life and starting to rethink about what um, what the ends of ph philosophy um, are and coming to this realization uh, that perhaps philosophy is 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 more uh, about a, a, a particular um, uh, disposition how does one dispose oneself to to reality uh, and and that that is obviously not, something you would want to leave reason behind and leave, you know, uh, uh, you know, art, art, articulations behind, uh, which is sort of the, the, the meat and potatoes of analytic philosophy. It's a type of rigor, a type of precision. So you don't want to exactly leave that behind when you're trying to dispose yourself to reality. But I think you, you kind of put the cart before, before the horse um, in analytic philosophy, or at least I, I did. I'll just speak for myself um, in, in that, like, if I can master precision then then I, I can master what it means to be a philosopher and and coming to the realization that um, logical rigor was uh, a means to something uh, and and having to rethink about what what was the point of this endeavor in the first place and so I've actually toyed with the idea of whether or not um, analytic philosophy could be um, incorporated into the philosophical way of life or not so is it like essentially or inherently, you know, um, opposed to uh, the, the 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 view of philosophy, maybe the, the ancient view. Um, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't think it is, but I don't know if it's typically practiced that way by analytic philosophers. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I remember when I took uh, logic anyway as as a philosophy undergrad. That uh, obviously I saw its value, and it does have value. And you can hear a but that's is coming along in here. Uh, logic obviously is absolutely critical in, in you, you have to learn all of that stuff. But I also remember thinking, even then as a young 20 year old <laughs> taking a logic course that, okay, this is valuable and it's useful, 
but this is not how people think. Yeah. This, this is not how people engage reality. It might be helpful if they're trying to construct an argument if somebody comes along and says, well, you've committed this fallacy and that fallacy, and this does not follow from that. And so, okay, great. You, you can help me hone my argument. But at the end of the day, it seems to me that a lot of philosophical thinking takes place inferentially, intuitionally, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, mm-hmm. in, in, in ways that, that tra- not defy logic, but transcend logic. So I just always also thought, along with my distaste for analytic philosophy, I had a certain impatience for philosophers that really mm-hmm. were so focused on logic and the construction and deconstruction of arguments that they sometimes miss the forest for the trees because right. they missed the intuitional inferential moments in a philosopher's thinking or somebody who is saying something philosophical. Do, do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I think in a, in a sense... Um... It that 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 is true, and there's also the the um, the consequence of uh, it, it it becomes a game, uh, you know, a, yeah. a game of of how do you best formulate, and and therefore it's not it's not really about truth, uh, it's more about um, uh, internal coherency, and and this is this was one of the the great uh, pains of 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 my my work uh, early on was. I found myself, you know, writing things where it, it turned out that, you know, oh, if you accept this, then you go this way. And if you accept this, then you have to go that way. And then, you know, if you accept this other thing, then you have to negate this thing. And, and so you kind of articulate, you know, the, 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 the decision tree and then you find yourself. Isn't that neat? Uh, and, 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 you, and you find, you know, that it, it, it almost is, is just for the sake of 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 just itself and and it, and it and it's not actually about about truth right. now no, no right. philosopher is going to want to say that and so they're always saying no it's about truth but um you know very few people are, are going to you know be willing to to die for their latest article in uh you know phil studies or something so i so i think i think there's this sense of um it's it's uh it it, it becomes an abstract game uh yeah. and 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 that's certainly the, the case when when the, the rigor of logic becomes the focus um, and then it yeah. abstracts away from actually what we how we think and what we care about uh and what gave rise yeah. to philosophy in the first place and it is to be remembered in terms of my own response to all of this that i'm a theologian of a particular sort and 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 not and not a philosopher uh and and so i'm i'm always wanting to run before i walk and I get sometimes impatient with the with philosophical arguments because I want to get to to the theological bits real quick, real fast. Uh, and and that's a flaw in me. I'm not I'm not praising that 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 is a flaw. Doctor Riches, uh, what what do you think of, of of that? What do you think of this? Uh, anyway, do you have any response well, to what? Yeah, Dr. yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean. Uh, the uh, what I thought maybe and it's a, maybe it's a segue into kind of some of the things that we're, we want to uh, talk yes. about around Balthazar and Plato. Adrian von Speyer in um, uh, the first volume of her commentary on the Gospel of John says something uh, you know I'm paraphrasing it, but that the difference between Adam and uh, and Mary is that Adam sought to know without love, where Mary was content to love without any need of knowing. And I think that that's the, um, I mean, I, I've never done any uh, analytic uh, philosophy. I, I, I mean, I've never really done any philosophy at all. I somehow got a master's degree, but that, that's sort of, a, a, <laughs> that's a side story. Um, but anyway, but the, but, the, but the point is that it's like the, the, the really existentially vital questions um, in life usually are not helped by, um, uh, an overly logistical kind of approach. They're, they're helpful. Right. You're saying the, the more in, intuitive to know that my mother loves me. I'm usually not helped by being a logician and, uh, and, and then uh, learning to love, to discern love, uh, to give love in return. I find that there I enter into the, the, the deepest realm of, of knowing, which is a kind of already a knowing beyond knowing if knowing is equated with sort of circumscribing truths and i think that that's the the place where um 
that's the, the the kind of place where Andy and I are kind of overlapping this. The, I mean, because the real thing that brings us together is we're doing this kind of crazy class on Plato and uh, Plotinus, and we're going to read some Augustine, and, and we're, we're, at, we're planning to end with Balthazar, more based on a intuition and a hunch than on any uh, any finished research. But I think that that's what we're after, is where philosophy and theology become uh, existentially vital. And theology has its own pitfalls, which are kinds of, um, uh, I, I guess, um, overly uh, rationalistic narrowing, sort of the, the neo-scholastic, um, a certain form of neo-scholastic uh, sort of rarification of things that you can see it. I mean, I, I particularly am interested in like in the liturgy, like the reduction of everything to, you know, is the sacrament valid? You know, if that's the kind of question you're right. asking, then you've, you've, you've departed from the encounter, which the liturgy is supposed to, you probably don't discern the body and blood in, in, the, in the way. That <laughs> uh, but yeah. anyway, uh, so it, is that kind of uh, overly sort of formalistic, juridical kind of, uh, of, of logic, but something that's existentially um, alive and mystically, I guess, op opening uh, of, of the soul or spirit. That's what we're, we're, it, we're, we're kind of after. And I think tying that up with Plato, I think there, there's a way to read the Phaedo uh, uh, that leads you to see, Here's a bunch of botched arguments, a bunch of failed arguments to, to arrive at the immortality of the soul. And then you have to ask the question, so what does the failure of those arguments um, mean? What's the meaning of that? Uh, and, and it might not be, well, we need to just come up with a better, you know, more careful, uh, you know, logically reasoned out uh, uh, argument. Maybe there's something about what drove us to argument in the first place yeah. uh, is, yeah. is what right. we need to retain. Right. And so I think I think there's something about um, you know, the, 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 the formalism perhaps of, of, of theology and the formalism of, of, of philosophy that, that sort of blinds us to what drove us in the first place to, to, um, to argument, what drove us in the first place to, to even ask the question of the validity of the sacraments or, and it, and, and it, 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 this is when I was saying it puts the cart before the horse that you kind of think that what matters are, are the, um, the rigor, the rigor, uh, and then you, you sort of lose sight of, what was the rigor for? Yeah, and I think that's one of the things, I mean, I think we see it in, even in our class that like the students, if you ask them like, okay, what's the takeaway? Can you tell us what did you learn right now? They say, oh my gosh, I don't know what I learned today. It was crazy in Jagger and Rich's class. The two of them started talking and talking and talking. And I think it's kind of like, you know, a declension of what I uh, experienced when I was at the University of Virginia. And I went to John Milbank's seminars on Neoplatonism, which was the first time I had this experience of like leaving so much richer than I came, but unable to kind of put into a formula what the heck it was I learned, mm -hmm. you know, but I right. knew I knew that my soul had been expanded. And like John would just sit there and he would just talk and the cat would jump up on his lap and Allison would bring in <laughs> tea and, and, and cookies. Right. But it was it was like it was exhilarating and I had no mm -hmm. idea what the hell was going on. But it was a kind of uh, in its own way, a kind of mystical encounter with something that was beyond knowing it, you know, in its own, in its own little way. Now, I mean, our seminar is sort of a, a, a <laughs> weak, a, a weak declension of what was happening in John. I mean, John yeah. is, is, is a, is a real, um, is a real mystic and brain box, but. Um, yeah, yeah, he is. By the way, I guess I mispronounced your name, Dr. Jaeger. At yeah. the beginning uh, of the okay. introduction, I called you're, you Jaeger. You're being too German there. I was, Jaeger. Yeah instead of jagger okay fine uh but i want to clear the record there that that's how they you, you pronounce your name i think that's true i mean um i mean all thinking philosophical theological uh, of that sort begins in my mind with an act of contemplative wonder i mean that would be yeah. the existential stance of yeah. any genuine thinker would be to who is concerned with the ultimate depths of things you are you you're, you're just struck with wonder why is there something rather than nothing but even that's kind of a banal and cliched question you're just you're just struck by the sheer facticity of things or even by the sheer the sheer unlikeliness of your own thoughts in your brain as you're sitting back and realize hey yeah i'm thinking of this who the hell am I? And what the hell is this stuff in my head? Yeah, that's yeah. going well, this on. This woman and on. loves me. Oh my gosh. What the yeah. hell is going on? You know, 
all of these, as C.S. Lewis once said, for example, as he looks out into his garden through the picture window, uh, that he's, you know, mesmerized by the garden. But the one thing that he often almost always overlooks is the window itself, which yeah. is which is what uh, makes the viewing even possible. And we often so take for granted, yeah. like that window, the, the sheer lunacy, <laughs> the unlikely improbability of us, of, of these minds that we have, and our ability to look out into the world and have it overwhelm us like that, that to me is, is the, the beginning of, of, all, of all genuine thinking. And so, yeah, um, I, I think that this is why I love Balthazar. In one sense, to use a German word, Balthazar just makes me feel gemütlich when I read him. You know, he makes, he just fills me with all kinds. I remember when I, was, I, I don't want to dominate the conversation here, but it can spur us on a little bit. I've said this before. Uh, when I was an undergraduate seminary, I had a spiritual director, Father Anton Morgenroth, and he was a convert from Judaism, a German. He had, right. His family had fled Germany because of Hitler, and he had converted to Catholicism, and there, there he was at the seminary. And I chose him as spiritual. He had known Balthazar, too. They weren't buddies, but he had known them, and they had, had, they had conversed and, and corresponded. And uh, I remember I, I walked into his room for the first spiritual direction, and he was an accomplished pianist loved Mozart, and he sat down at his piano, which is a big grand piano. And by the way, he looked like a cross between Albert Bernstein and Alfred Hitchcock, so he was like a character right out of central casting. So he sits down at the piano, and he proceeds to play from memory something from Mozart for about half an hour. And he gets done, and he says, okay, this is the same time next week. And I said, but Father, what about spiritual direction? And he just looks at me, you stupid bastard, that was spiritual direction. <laughs> you know, sure. and that, that was my first lesson in, in him sort of guiding my young little nerdy little nose, pointing me towards the fact yeah. that whatever I was going to do at the seminar, intellectually or otherwise, yeah. has got to begin with that first just that appreciation of sitting and, and contemplatively letting something of beauty wash over you yeah mm -hmm. yeah and i thought when you know the comment that you made before larry i think abraham heschel says something like awe is to the study of uh, of god and religion what precision is to the study of mathematics right like if you don't yeah, have yes. awe and wonder don't think you're going to find anything here right right Right. And, and, and I think that that's, that's why, you know, taking a, a, a class on Neoplatonism with John Milbank, which I did not learn a thing in, uh, a thing from in terms of like something concrete I could take away, except for the names of the books, uh, was nevertheless not wasted because it really, it really sparked that awe and wonder. And that's kind of what we're, we're what, you, what you encountered was a mind at work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You yeah. encountered a creative and elastic mind uh, clearly being able to ex expositate yeah. you know on on the deepest and most profound things because of the alacrity of that mind i've had a few professors like that i don't think of the caliber of of, of john um, but i know what you're talking about and and it's rather profound when it happens um but let's let's uh let's then steer this back because i want to talk about hegel too and we're already well into our conversation here i uh i want to talk what with with, with regard to uh plato's metaphysics in particular in light of what we're talking about here in terms of awe contemplative wonder and so forth it is often been my thought and it's not original to me obviously uh that there's a reason why plato remains completely relevant today as much so today as he was you know 23, 2400 years ago. And it is precisely because permeating Plato's metaphysics, it seems to me, is this great awareness that in, in the great chain of being, in the hierarchies they are represented, and in the forms they are represented, there is this beauty, as Balthazar would say, the splendor that shines forth, that you can just tell Plato is is. He's both in awe of, but then he is grappling with it yeah. right? and, 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 and not quite knowing what to do with it. So he often writes 
poetically and mythically to try and capture what his what his insight yeah. is. is. Do you think that's an accurate portrayal uh, of, of Plato? Uh, I think so. Um, and I, I think there's there's also a, if you want to call it a meta question going on, what was the point of Plato writing? Uh, and right. and I think, uh, I mean, my view, my view of the dialogues is that to read a dialogue is um, to engage in the act of philosophizing. So it's not just to tell you about things. Right. Um, it's to make you, not to make you, to invite you um, to become a participant in a sense in the, in the dialogue itself. And so um, I, I think it's, this is why a lot of the dialogues end back at the beginning where uh, they, they, they began, because in a sense, the point of it was, was participation. It was, it was to yes. draw the reader. Yes. And, and so I think um, this is, this is the perennial uh, nature of the dialogue is that whenever you have beings that can wonder, you can have beings that can be brought into the questions of what is piety, what is justice, what is truth. Um, it, it, it's, it's, if it's on the same level as a scientific hypothesis, then it's going to be old news within about, you know, 20 or 30 years. And so I don't think that the dialogues themselves are things that can be outdated by the very, by the very right. fact that what they most fundamentally are, uh, are, are these posing of, of these questions, not attempts to answer the questions, but an attempt to say, look, unless you ask this question, you're not like fully human, uh, and yeah. and you and you have this sort of urge to ask these these fundamental questions. So it's it's to try to bring people into a philosophical life. Um, and so I think that that is contributing to the um, to, to to the nature of 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 how they've 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 lasted. And and also I think uh, accounts for why uh, you can write a dialogue without ex being exactly sure where it's going to go. And 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 maybe saying things that are kind of contradictory at one place or at another. And, and um, it's sort of like being a human being where I contradict myself from one day to the next. And, uh, you know, I'll take things back. And, and the point uh, of, of that whole process is to see um, what it means to be human. Uh, and, and so right. I think there's something about the nature of the dialogue that is proposing that to, to the reader. Uh, That's interesting. Yeah. We've all had that experience. If you begin writing... And yeah. uh, you have an idea in your mind. And about halfway through, you realize I'm full of crap. Uh, uh, <laughs> wait a minute. Th this whole conversation I'm having with myself is taking me this way and not that way. Sure. And, and you run with you either trash the whole thing or you say, oh, wait a minute. I've just I've stumbled onto something here in the very act of writing, in the very process of writing. Yeah. yeah. Let's shift gears a second. And um, because you mentioned Plotinus, too. It seems to me, in, in having done my own research in Balthazar's metaphysics, uh, that w one of Balthazar's concerns, of course, in dealing with the Greeks, is, is he's watching them grapple with the issue of the relationship between the one and the many, between the ground of things and then all of this multiplicity and, and particularity yeah. and, and how those two things relate. And he has this great love for the Homeric myths because he believes that they preserve the dialogical element yes, uh, yes. between humanity and divinity, even though the gods are finite and capricious and arbitrary and fragmented and cannot serve as a proper theological unifying force for, for everything. Nevertheless, there is this inchoate in intuition that the Homeric world seems to have that the gods do speak to us, that, we, that there's a dialogical yeah. element between the one and the many. Yeah, but but then Balthazar goes on to say, you compare that then to the Platonic stream, which as it moves forward seems to want to always flow in the direction of a more monistic reduction yeah. of things to a kind of spiritual monism of, of of some kind, and the dialogical element gets lost. So then, of course, Balthazar uses this impasse to develop his thesis theologically that only in really the Christian Trinitarian conception yeah. of God is this dynamic ever really going to be worked out. So can you, you want to comment on that? Maybe we'll start with Aaron. Well, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I guess fundamentally I agree with it because I happen to be a Christian. 
Um, yeah. I mean, I think that what I think is what I think is great about Balthazar here in the first place is that he retrieves the uh, the the place of the the Homeric gods in in, in this regard. Like he and yeah. he and he when in ret retrieving them, he's also retrieving a certain face of Yahweh in his relationship to his people, the jealous God, the rageful God, you know, all that. And Balthazar wants a lot more blood put back into Christianity. Um, and one of the ways that he does it is by saying, you know, I want the whole Hellenic world, not just the, um, uh, right. the Neoplatonic world, let's say. Um, and I think that it's true when you're reading Plotinus, one of the amazing things about Plotinus is that there is no history there, right? The history, true. history, History doesn't exist for Plotinus. I'm not sure. I'm not sure uh, how much we can say, though. I mean, the the one, the one is the one is beyond. I mean, the one is almost beyond itself. But there is there's an there's a way that like when you, when you really see what Plotinus is up to, it, whatever level of being you're at, there's there there is like that you have received goodness means that out of charity you must go down in order to come up and so there is a way that you there's a kind of there's like already the the, the metaphysical infrastructure in a certain sense in plotinus for something christian to happen and um i'm not sure how it how it, how it would relate in the greek world to the homeric gods uh but but there, there's a there's a deep richness there which i, I wouldn't say um, is necessarily monistic because it seems like it seems like it's impossible for the descent not to start again in order right. for the reversion to happen. Right. Um, right. Yeah. This well, is, I, I, I think well, it makes perfect sense because Balthazar says these things that the 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 the, the Plotinian stream trends monistic but he's very careful not to say that it right. is monistic yeah, yeah, yeah. and for the very reasons that you state which is why balthazar thinks plotinus comes really close oh, yeah. mean, just really unbelievably close to the christian conception of things yeah now i i i haven't i haven't uh read uh proclus in a long time properly but i know that like you know john makes a big deal that Proclus gets it more right, or at least he did uh, 10 years ago. Then Proclus gets it more right than Plotinus. Um, and uh, I'm, not, I, I'm not sure that I can, I can say uh, yes or no, but I think that the other thing that, that's important to notice is that there, there are all kinds of different articulations within this Neoplatonic uh, tradition. And yes. the amazing thing is the Neoplatonic tradition stops. Well, it doesn't stop. It becomes Christian. Right. It really it really all does feed back into Christianity and it, it doesn't continue because it does find its home in, in, in different different streams of, of Christianity. And, and that's that's one of the other incredible, um, amazing things to me. That, that's a really interesting point, you know, that I had actually never dwelt on or thought about that much, that the, that the, the sort of that tradition uh, play, Plato, Plotinus, Proclus, those guys, it really kind of comes to an end. Uh, as an independent tradition with sure, Christianity, yeah. with Christianity, because Christianity takes it up and really sorts of uh, fulfills it in a, in a lot of interesting way. Balthazar also retrieves the, the tragedians, I think, in, in uh, the great yeah. uh, tra uh, tragedies mm -hmm. in, in very, very interested ways. Uh, in Theodrama 4, uh, my friend Cyrus Brewster is always wanting to, he loves this verse where Balthazar talks about how in, in many of these Greek tragedies, you, the, 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 the tragic heroes, Balthazar says, um, uh, have the valor of an unshielded heart. Uh, and and he, he builds on that and, and, and says what it is. It, it, for, for the Greeks, they knew that glory resided someplace, someplace up there with the yeah. gods. And in order to get some of that glory, I, I, I've, I've got to, in a sense, open myself to that and, and do heroic things or whatever. But, they, but in, 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 the, in the Greek world, that, that required a kind of unshielding of their heart in very vulnerable ways because they didn't yeah. have a whole lot of theological apparatus to do it. And, and, and so extrapolating from that, I mean, Balthazar goes on to say, you know, Christians have to have this valor of the unshielded yeah. heart, mm -hmm. you know. Um, anyway, I don't know what, what point I'm trying to make with that, except to say, yeah, Balthazar is saying, I want the entirety of the Hellenic world 
Well, well, de death certainly. I mean, I think in in Greek tragedy, but I think it's there too. I think that um, it's there too already in Homer. I mean, Achilles. It's hard to understand uh, Achilles. Achilles is a very strange figure, but at the very least, you can say that he dis he discovers or he decides that 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 glory is not worth is not worth dying for, right? I mean, he's, right, he's offended right. by Agamemnon, but he also says, "And and you know what, glory you can give you can give me back the girl and and a lot more. I don't care. I'm not going to fight for you." But once he's once he once Patroclus dies. And he, for the sake of his friend, for the sake of like a kind of, uh, a, a, like a kind of blood covenant with his friend, then he will go. And he knows that if he dies, if he goes back onto the battlefield, he will die. He will die young rather than go home and die old. Right. And, right. and death, death starts to take on, you know, the, 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 um, the place of kind of an ultimate, of an ultimate sign. And I think that like only Christianity answers this for sure, right? Because for us right. too, death, and I think this is in, this is all all through Balthazar, but death is the ultimate sign that there's only one thing that's really necessary for man, and that is the resurrected one. Right? Only 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 he right. can conquer this mm -hmm. failure, mm -hmm. which is uh, it's it. Yeah, I mean, let's say that this failure, this wound in our being. Yeah. Yeah, because death is really that that great that great line uh, that, in, in a sense, uh, if it remains uncrossed in a, in a way that's fulfilled in, in something beyond, it really puts the short circuit on on everything. Uh, I mean, you see this, you see this, you know, in Saint Paul, when it, it to me is very very clear that for Saint Paul. You can, you, in, in a sense, yes, he's got all this sacrificial language, uh, you know, temple, you know, the law and Christ, blah, 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 all that stuff. Uh, I don't want to go into a great deal of uh, parsing of that. But at the end of the day, it, it's very clear for Paul, it is death. It is death that gives life its sting, right? right. The, and, and, and it is death that then creates sin, in a sense, our awareness of death, our fear of death. We become yeah. slaves to the fact that we are going to die. And, and that's that great barrier that we all know we're going to have to cross. And it puts it puts to the sword all of our pretensions if, if it's looked at squarely. And, and but it can lead usually, you know, in the pre-Christian world to just despair. Uh, how do yeah. how, what do we and, and but for Paul, therefore, it is the resurrection that therefore liberates us and only the resurrection which liberates us because it removes yeah. that. It removes that sting. And I think, therefore, I think that's what you just said is so brilliant because I think it's absolutely true. I, I think that the, the specter of death is something that, that looms large over the entire Hellenic world. Um, and it's because, home, it's because it's a kind of an intuitive sense, right? What, what it says uh, in, in wisdom, you know, like man was not made for death. And like, we all know this, right? We right. all know this. Like, you know, when, when my friend, when, when Patroclus dies, Achilles will throw it all in because he knows that there is no justice, no beauty, no goodness in a world in which Patroclus does not live. So the hell with it, I'll die. And and this is this is also Plato's uh, view of death too. I mean, in a sense, in a sense, like the 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 the, the push to try to show that death actually is a sort of life that like the philosopher, yeah. what the philosopher's life is, it's a sort of death. It's an attempt to like overcome death overcome the problem of death uh and 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 therefore like it it's it almost be it almost becomes something that it's that it's not uh that that for the philosophers it's almost as if there is no death uh right and and this is i think what's perhaps unique in christianity is that um death isn't something to be overcome in the in the in the the, the sort of the platonic sense that you you find it as not not in a sense real uh it, it yeah, it's, right. it's rather it's most real i mean if, if, if it's recognized as like participation in like the the, the kenosis yeah. on the cross it's like the most real uh event rather than something to um to see as like getting beyond or getting 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 past or getting uh, uh over yeah we I have this instinctive awareness obviously people in fearing death have a fear of annihilation that there's 
Okay, right. it's just the snuffing out of a candle, and it's been a fun ride, but it's done, and I'm sad that the ride is over, and and people can fear that. But obviously, I think that's an extremely superficial understanding of why death fills us with a certain existential, not just dread, but wonder. Mm. Yeah, because it is an awareness that there is something obnoxiously wrong about human beings dying, <laughs> Which, especially when you encounter the death of of, of a loved one, right. uh, and and. You know, as we've all as we've all probably experienced, and and you realize this is not natural. This that, is not that's natural. The, that's the beauty of the way that the Phaedo starts, right? I mean, oh, absolutely. Tell me how Socrates died. Yeah, I want to hear yeah, all of you that. there. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. The death of Socrates. And and he, I mean, throughout this is the one thing that I realized with Aaron when we were reading through the Phaedo just a couple of weeks ago. There is the um, over and over and over again the the reference to whether or not. Um, one is present at the death of Socrates. So there's something about being there while Socrates is dying, which is, which is significant to what it is to be a philosopher. And I think, I think um, it, it's seen in how Socrates dies that the, the life of the philosopher is revealed. So it's almost as if what he's trying to say is the death of Socrates reveals what it is to be Socrates, what it is, what it is to, 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 to live the Socratic life. And, um, and then I think that's the emphasis on how do you become present. Uh, and it's also, I think, well, sort of last point, it's significant that the whole dialogue is a recollection, mm -hmm. which is an attempt to, to represent, yes. make, yes. make, make one back present. Uh, so. And here's yeah. and the, Go, the, the, the real difference of Christianity, I think, is like, you know, the way that Socrates faces death is with a kind of, let's say, a spiritual serenity. He understands that it is not the last word. And it's almost as if, almost as if death doesn't touch him, mm -hmm. even though even though it kills him. When yeah. you come to Christ, you get you get the exact opposite. Yeah. He's afraid of dying and he descends right into the shit of death. Right. Yeah, absolutely. The complete, the complete failure of death. And he takes that thing, what we all know is completely inhuman, and he makes it precisely in its inhumanity and its failure. In its fearfulness, in, in in the whole horror of it, he makes it mm -hmm. the sign of victory, because he proves he proves that he he belongs more to the Father than he belongs to himself, and absolutely he more for us. Mm -hmm. I've had students wonder, well, why was Jesus afraid of death? Didn't he know he was going to rise? Yeah. Oh God, you missed the point. It, on, only one who is life itself could recoil in such horror before the reality yeah. of death, knowing, knowing better than any of us how horrific it is that, that, that we die in, in the manner that we die, in the manner that we do die and, and, and the manner that we experience it. I'm also reminded, you know, the scene in the Gospel of John, I mean, the shortest verse in, in the Bible, Jesus wept. All right. He weeps at the tomb of his friend Lazarus. And of course, you can Lazarus, you know, you can say, oh, he's weeping at the lack of faith of the people that are wailing in the background or he's weeping at, uh, you know, the fact that they've you know made such a big deal about this. Oh, come on. Don't you know he's going to rise from the dead someday? No, th there's also the explanation that Jesus is weeping because what he's encountering in this entire scene is the full existential impact of our sins and how we experience death. Mm -hmm. And he's understanding, he understands better than anybody standing around him there, that this is not how human beings were meant to meet their demise, yeah. right? That Man this is not made for this. Yeah, you know, that this is unnatural. Uh, and he is about to show that it's unnatural, which I'm always... I'm always sad that the Gospel of John never gives us any further information about what in the hell Lazarus did after he was, uh, you know, brought back from the dead, uh, and and you know, it, it, to, to detail what it was that he went through or whatever. But anyway, uh, but that's neither. You know, and here's maybe the the place where, like, I really think that Balthazar has a, a genius is because this is like you know all this focus right down on like the point of failure, and he he makes a real meal of this. You know, especially in the theodrama, and it's because he 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 discerns that therein, like all these threads, kind of join. You know, the the different Platonic threads, the philosophical threads, religious threads. That everything comes to to the point of death, and there, the glory of the Lord. That's the moment of glory, and that's the moment of like the true theological 
aesthetic, right? It's it's not actually in things that are pretty. Things that are pretty right. can point to war, but the moment of glory is the letting go. The moment of glory is the kenosis. It, it is the free descent down in love, and therefore the the the, the breaking of, of a love that gives life from that moment of darkness. And that's that's yeah. the that that I think the convertibility in a certain sense, I guess, for Balthazar, you know, you say like the, the beauty is a kind of a, a transcendental of the transcendentals, but that love is the real transcendental of the transcendentals, right? And yes. and, and, and it's proven on, on on the cross. It's proven in the in the in the in the, the descent that love makes. But that you got in Plotinus. Yeah. In certain yeah, ways. You, do. You, don't, you don't have it, you don't have it in a historical sense, but you have the metaphysical kind of apparatus of it yeah. already yeah. in Plotinus. I think this is one of the amazing things about about Plotinus. We, we were going back mm -hmm. and forth about about this, but the 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 uh the real, there really is a, a, a kind of kenosis uh, in Plotinus, which is exhilarating. And are you guys teaching this right now, this semester, in a class? Yeah, it's a, it's a two semester, a two semester class. So we're on the the first semester, uh, doing Plato, Plotinus, and a lot of Augustine. And how do this? How are this to, to shift gears a bit? How do the students receive this? I mean, how how are they reacting? <laughs> you know, to, probably to similar to Aaron's reaction to uh, uh, Milbank, which is uh, well, <laughs> well. I mean, we're just very we're just, good. We're recapitulating that experience. We're we're we're, we're making them present. Uh, if, if if we could bottle John and bring him here, then it would be a really great experience for them. But we're the best that they've got, so they know they know no better. Um, John's John surrogates are yeah. No, I mean, I think that I mean, I think the thing is. I mean, the students here at the college, my own sense of them is, I, I mean, you, you have an amazing sort of purity of heart uh, among them. So they are, they're open, they're, they're really open to the, the, the question and they're open to be challenged to ask new questions. And so they're really ready for, um, they're, re they're ready for all. They are. And yeah. I'm glad to hear that they still are. I mean, I haven't been inside uh a class, an undergraduate classroom in, in about 10 years now. Uh, but in my 20 years of teaching exclusively undergraduates at, at DeSales University, uh, that, that was my overriding experience as well. I mean, obviously you, you meet the resistant student here and there, the obnoxious student here and there who's in your face about this or that. But my overwhelming experience of teaching undergraduates was one of watching them open up to what I was saying, and my colleague Rodney Hauser uh, taught in a similar way, uh, because what they were simply struck with was awe, and not yeah. at me, but at what it yeah, was yeah, that yeah. I was teaching, because yeah. that this is not stuff that they get at church, and it's not stuff that they get at home, and it's not stuff that they get from their culture, yeah. and it's not stuff that they get from TV or video, you know, or internet or anything. They don't get it at all anywhere and they walk into a classroom and all of a sudden the, these these two yokels here you guys and then hauser and i back in the day come in and with you with milbank and you're just sitting there and what they recognize and once again it's not your genius what they're recognizing is the perennial deep profound truth of what it is that that yeah. you are presenting yeah. to them and yeah, it hits them cool. it hits them and like you with Milbank, I'm not, I was never quite certain that they were actually learning anything of specific concept, which is, by the way, to switch gears. One of the reasons why I quit teaching was because when I quit, and I don't know if it's still true, the accrediting agencies were all blah, insane over assessment, 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 assessment. And so you, 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 your syllabi went from being three pages long that you could pass out on the first day of the semester to 30 pages long, which you had to give to them two months in advance on Blackboard or whatever, filled up with all the proper students will be able to do this and they will. And what, what testing device are you going to use to make sure they know X, Y, Z and bang, shimmy, shang this and shimmy, shang that. And you get to it and you realize nothing that I teach can be assessed in this way, <laughs> you know? That's that's the point I'm trying to make here and with regard to what you guys, I think, are trying to do in your classroom. You know, how do you assess the engendering of awe in a student? <laughs> and, and here's this is this is sort of to, to, to push this in a, in, a, in a little further uh, down the road. Uh, it it might actually turn out that 
a type of going back to the the rigor the rigor point a type of like academic rigor yeah. uh, might actually get in the way because uh, then they they start to think the point of this classroom is writing the the, the best paper or the point of this right. classroom is making sure I get all the right you know the right content out of the book and 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 I gotta you know make sure I, I have the the right conceptual grasp of the content which is the best way to kill wonder you know that's the best way to, to <laughs> make someone not be uh, yeah. philosophical. Uh, and so it's it's hard to 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 um, to help someone understand what what that is because the the, the way that it used to be uh, to maybe draw it out uh, you know laying down certain requirements you now find as the end and not the means and so um, I mean I don't think academic rigor is going to uh, you know waken people to, to 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 the wonder of being it's it's likely going to um, yeah. make people good at, at jumping through hoops. Yeah. yeah, obviously, even in the theology classes that I taught, there's content that you expect the students to master. I mean, if we're reading Augustine's City of God, I expect you to read the City of God and to know, you know, X, Y, Z about the City of God. Um, but if that's all you've learned in my class, I would consider it a complete and abject failure. Um and and the ultimate aim is 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 something else, something higher. Hey, before we get off here, okay. Oh, geez, we're already like approaching. I think about an hour. How long have we been going here? Fifty six minutes. Oh, we still got time. This is good. I want. I, I I don't want to get out of here without talking a little bit about Hegel. Now, in our pre emails, you were all saying, "Well, we're not really Hegel scholars just yet, and don't know what." But Hegel fascinates me uh, endlessly. I've read him. I read him for my doctoral studies because I understood, well, you can't really understand Balthazar until you read Hegel and Kant and Fichte and all these German idealists, right? Um, and I remember thinking Hegel is very dense and difficult to read. But unlike the analytic philosophers, like I said, who I wanted to gouge out my eyes, I found Hegel endlessly fascinating. And I found that I was really drawn uh, to what it was he was trying to to say and in my mind the the chief insight of hegel which i think remains true is that the relationship between god and the world cannot be an extrinsicist one uh and and that history therefore has to have some kind of significance theologically mm -hmm. beyond simply the concept of salvation history and shit happens and god comes to us and all this kind of stuff but something yeah. <laughs> yes. But you get what I'm drifting at here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the perennial punch yeah. of Hegel. Balthazar recognized that, of course, as so many do, that this is. Uh, yeah. And I think I think David Christopher Schindler, D.C. Schindler, is really onto this in important ways as well. But anyway, what what say either one of you to to Balthazar's approach to Hegel and to that that question of of history's theological significance? Well, I mean, so uh, let me let me take a, a, a stab at a couple of comments, which um, are from a, uh, a you know a dabbler, not from anybody who has any. Well, I'm just a dabbler too, so a dabbler among dabblers here. Okay. Um, well, I mean, I think in the first place, it's interesting. I mean, so we've been uh, we've been thinking about you know how we situate Hegel and all of this, and Hegel is in a certain sense one way of understanding Hegel's like. You know, a, a modern a modern Plotinus or a, a modern reception of Plotinus. I mean, he's also a reception of Christian doctrine and Christianity. Um, but he gives history in a certain sense uh, to to Plotinus, which Plotinus doesn't have so much. But then, in the other the other way, from a, a Christian point of view, I think this is one of the the big points that uh, Balthazar sort of more inchoately is dissecting. But I think that Cyril O'Regan does more. Is that yes. at the same at the same time as he's receiving the Christian tradition and, and apparently giving us a theology of history, he's also emptying history out of its evental quality. And uh, that means that the events of history no longer have much density once you, 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 you pull the, um, the, you, the, the disembodied doctrine off of them. And now everything becomes focused on the, 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 uh, the, the, the spirit, the spirit, and the, the incarnation really um, gets more or less um, uh, done, done away with as, as, the, as the absolute center. 
And I think that's uh, that's one of the big problems. Now, I get, I think that, like, I mean, if I understand rightly, I mean, I think Cyril Regan, and I know you had him on recently. Cyril's yeah. the Cyril's the the real guy uh, on this. I don't think anyone can say uh, can say more uh, than than he has, uh, or say it better than he has. The other thing, though, with Hegel is that uh, Hegel seems to recognize very much the kind of um, the way in which uh, the, uh, the the relationship of the I and thou is kind of constitutive of the subject. Mm -hmm. But it seems, again, that here one of the essentials of Christianity is lost, which is that it's not rooted in what John Milbank would call an ontology of love. It's rooted in an ontology uh, uh, of violence. So I don't think we can be quick to cast Hegel off, and I certainly am not bright enough to do that. Um, but it seems like Hegel, what Cyril O'Regan sort of shows us is that you know Hegel's a great a great act of misremembering the Christian past that once it's been accomplished can't really be lightly dismissed. It has to be reintegrated into something like this, you know, sort of. The um, yes. uh, the anatom the anatomy of misremembering that, that Balthazar sort of performs. Now, you got to be a pretty big brain to be able to do all that kind of stuff. Well, you know, Cyril's got all, that big. Cyril's got that big brain. <laughs> yeah, between <laughs> between Cyril and Balthazar, that can be done. You know, for us here, you know, we just try and present <laughs> it to the students. I can't tell you. I mean, I, I've done so many of these videos now. When I got done with the Cyril O'Regan interview i i got all these tons of these emails from people saying is he maybe the smartest man who ever lived <laughs> you know <laughs> it's just so amazing yeah the depth of thought that comes out of that guy you know just boom just like that without you know and the encyclopedic breadth of his knowledge yeah. of things yeah. so and impressive I think, I think like i mean i think andy wants to jump in too for, on mm -hmm. on this but i think that I think that John Milbank and uh, Cyril here are actually pretty close, even though I know that, you know, John, John has a couple of critical remarks to make, but there is a sense that like, you know, the problems of, uh, uh, of Hegel from a Christian point of view are, are so deep, right? Because it's, it has to yeah. do with like, you know, a metaphysics of generosity, a metaphysics of love. And yet Hegel is so right. And Hegel is so colossal that he can't be, Put aside, right? And, right. And, and this is this is the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and mm -hmm. and um, at the end of the day, it seems to me, like I, I I'm with you. Like I said, I mean, when I read Hegel, I couldn't I couldn't not pay attention to him. I was aware that there are deep problems here, but but he just kept putting his finger on certain things that I thought were so critically important uh, that we at least take them up, at least try and grapple with them. But really, at the end of the day, there's no theodrama in, in Hegel, yeah. it seems to me. And that goes to John, uh, you know, Milbank's point about it's, 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 it's not about an ontology of love. It's about an ontology of violence. And it seemed to me that only an ontology of love could sustain a true theodrama the way that, yeah. you know, that, that Balthazar appropriates uh, the philosophic tradition. Um, so one, I guess one, one, one thought um, I had on that, um, I guess uh, there, there's something analogous, I think, that occurs in attempts to uh, arrive at, at, you know, proofs or uh, assertions of God's existence through contingency, which uh, contingency does seem to be a call or a cry for a cause, uh, uh, something uh, ne uh, necessary, but you have to be careful in how you relate the contingency to the necessary, because it could turn out that the way in which you do that, it makes the contingent actually become necessary. So, so like yeah. you have something that's contingent and you need to have yeah. this clause for it, an explanation for it. And so by, by incorporating contingency within necessity, it actually becomes necessary, a, a, a necessity, yeah. right? And I think something similar, not obviously the same, but something similar analogous is occurring with history, that once once it, it, it's taken in, in, a, in a type of um, logical structure, it, it almost loses its its yeah. force as history, um, which is a, a sort of a contingent a contingency. And it becomes it becomes something of uh, a, a 
necessitated contingency yeah. or necessitated history. And therefore, it, the whole meaning of it in the first place is then lost. Yeah. Um, Only yeah. love guarantees freedom. And, you know, what, what Ulrich would talk about, like logizing, you know, logizing always ends in violence, right? It, you know, reason has to mm -hmm. open to something beyond it, which is love. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. And and it does, though, precisely to go back to Andrew's point, in and through the contingent, precisely right. as contingent. Yeah. yeah. Balthazar says, you know, uh, because of the incarnation, Christianity is the is the is the religion of the poets par excellence, uh, because only via the incarnation are we then going to get a theological ground of possibility for affirming the absolute ontological importance of the contingent, the concrete, the particular, in their particularity. Yeah, and that yeah. they're not simply taken up in some kind of heuristic yeah. mm -hmm. sort yeah. of right. history of some kind. Uh, I, 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 just, I find all of that stuff just endlessly fascinating. But before we go, let's talk about, um, you know, Hegel has this thing about the speculative Good Friday, okay? Uh, and I, 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 I'm no expert on it, okay? But here it seems to me, you know, we're, we're, we're Balthazar's meditations on, on Good Friday, on the death of Christ, uh, so far outstrip this, because it, it, the Hegelian concept here, because in, in so many ways, it goes back to what Aaron, you said, and Andrew, you said as well about the contingent, but also what Aaron said about... Um, Oh, no, I lost my train the of eventual, thought. The eventual quality of history. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The eventual quality of history. Yes. Um, so, do you have any thoughts on that? On Hegel's philosophizing about the death of Christ and and where it falls short? Well, I mean, I, I think that the I think I'm not sure because uh, I haven't uh, probably not good to say on a podcast. There's a book you haven't read, but. Uh... Especially one that well, you, 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 is you important to read. Of all the important books to read, I think that um, you know De Lobach's book on Joachim of Fiore, um, I think, deals with with yes. this exactly. And it's that the, the 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 spirit has to be the spirit of of Christ, and it has to bear witness to the event of Christ. The end of history has already come two thousand years ago in Christ, and we live now. The tension of the already but not yet we we know how history in a certain sense is going to uh work out not um you know sort of in details but in the sense that that love has already triumphed and i think that that's um that's the key so i mean maybe here you know uh i mean when, when balthazar says you know it's par excellence the the uh uh, um, Christianity par excellence, the, the religion of the poets. I mean, certainly you think that like when when Peggy talks about the event, and it's it's interesting, you know, that you know Alain Badieu has like stolen from Peggy what he can, you know, to get his Marxist stuff going again, and it's all about the event. But it's also in the case of Badieu, interesting. Like you know, he wants love back in. You know, he he wants to try and find a way to put love back into things. But it's it's that the, the real the real thing that happens to me, which is the real source of all knowledge and all life, is the event of being loved. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that is, to me, what is missing in Hegel. Absolutely. Uh, that is exactly what is missing in Hegel. And I think that's what Balthazar thinks is missing in Hegel. Uh, but I think you're right. Hegel has to be dealt with. But I, I agree with you with regard to, I, I just absolutely love Cyril's O'Regan's project of, 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 in a sense, referring to all of this as a kind of misremembering. Uh, but, but it is a misremembering that we need to deal with because that misremembering has become the remembering of our culture. Yeah. Uh, and if we don't address it, if we don't call it out, if we don't critique it, uh, then it's just going to become standard narrative. Um, and and it, you know, it might actually circle back to your original point about um, people reading Balthazar as reading Plato in a sort of a, a, a myopic or a, a you know a Balthazarian way, and it, and yeah. it might actually be that yeah. um, we've misremembered what uh, uh, Plato is is up to, uh, right? So I mean, I, I think right there, there's there's some baggage in in the attribution yeah. of. Oh, you're just reading this in in your particular way, and and I, 
um, at least when it when it comes to I mean I I don't know Hegel very well but but at least when it comes to Plato um, the the more that I read Plato sort of with 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 sort of what I what I hope to be honest eyes and and willing to to, to admit my ignorance uh, about my interpretations of Plato the more I start to see uh, things that I that I wouldn't have expected to to see there uh, so so I think there's something um, there, there there's something about the methodology of, of Balthazar might might itself just be uh, and then the critiques might might also be wrapped up in this this whole this whole concept no and i th i think that's absolutely true and cyril cyril also applies that same reasoning to why doing intellectual genealogies of modernity are are, are so very important even though they're fraught with peril yeah uh, you know like i said to him I once knew an Orthodox priest who said to me, that it's all, in all seriousness, you know, I can prove to you in five or six easy historical steps how we get from the filioque to the Holocaust. Uh, and, and, you know, we, <laughs> I didn't press him on it because I really didn't believe that it was possible and I didn't care. Uh, but we, we're all conversant, therefore, with these kinds of flawed uh, intellectual genealogies. But the good ones are absolutely necessary for this very reason to combat this this misremembering, uh, and 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 in, in the way to combat misremembering and the way to do it through these intellectual genealogies is precisely to retrieve the past creatively with an eye towards right. why right. in the hell it still matters yeah. now. Right, which yeah. is which is which is why having the perfect interpretation or the the most slavishly accurate rendition of a right. thinker is not the most important thing. Right. The most important thing is to no. see how it's useful today in order to make an experience again of the event of Jesus Christ. Which because is, that was perhaps the reason why it was written in the first place. Uh, right. So exactly. Right. If you don't think that that was the, the origin of the work in the first place, then uh, you're I mean, you're, you're sort of lost in the interpretation from the get go. Which is why to my dying day, I'm going to be uh, a resource monk theologian because i don't think that there is any other way for a catholic theologian to be because you know the resource monk guys are often accused of saying oh you just you just want a patristic fundamentalism you want to do an end run around aquinas so you can quote no 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 what they're trying to do is exactly what cyril o'regan is talking about here it's a creative retrieval of those sources with an eye towards why in the heck those sources still have this potency and this power for our time uh, yeah. today uh, which is why I, I have no patience for Catholic traditionalism no patience for the unhinged Catholic progressivism um, to me the only path forward is some version some iteration of the resource mont retrieval of our misremembered past in, 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 in so many different ways but anyway that's my yeah. fulmination that's and then, go ahead have, Aaron can I add one yeah. thing to that which I think you'll agree with is also it has to be you know um, you know a, a, a platonic uh, a, a platonic Christianity, not in the sense that it dispenses with Aristotle, but that Aristotle, uh, like we see that the, 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 the problem of a, of a narrow Aristotelian neo-scholastic Thomism is, 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 is the loss of the splendor of the form. Even in the liturgy, the, 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 the crisis of the liturgy is a crisis that began long before the Second Vatican Council. And exactly. it was a myopic reductive uh, attention to, you know, um, uh, the, to the juridical, to, um, you know, to, to valid sacraments. And, right. and what we want is life. We want it abundantly. And the, 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 there needs to be a sense of participation and the splendor of, of, of form. You know, I wasn't going to say that, and you said it better than I could anyway. Uh, so that's a great way to sort of end this conversation because I have, I've long held the conviction that uh, we, we need a more robust retrieval of Platonic Christianity <laughs> uh, in order to combat uh, some of the worst elements. I mean, I like Aristotle. But, no, Aristotle is uh, great. But, yeah, Ar okay. you know, Plotinus, one of the great things about reading Plotinus, you're like, he, he quotes from Aristotle all the time. He has no problem with Aristotle. Or don't ever forget, like, Thomas Aquinas thought the book of causes for many many years he thought the book of causes was written by aristotle like what kind of aristotle yeah. did he read you know yeah, exactly so, I mean, but this 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 uh, when i say platonic i mean a platonic in the sense that participation 
uh, yes. the splendor of form, and one in which Aristotle is, is, is a part of it, but Aristotle is never juxtaposed to it, right? Right, and, right. Uh, that, that's the... That's read, the it read as a participant, Aristotle read as a participant, actually right. in, in his own way, in that tradition. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Which, which is another thing that the resourcement guys, you know, to me, this is sort of what De Lubach was trying to point yeah. out with regard to Aquinas, right? Is that you guys, you're reading him backwards, all right? Yeah. You got to read him this way, uh, in in the light of a certain tradition, and and not through the lens of what you want him to say because of later disputes with Protestants about the gratuity of grace and so on and so forth. But anyway, uh, we're kind of out of time. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. I hope the conversation uh, went as, as you, you had hoped it would. Uh, I thought it was great. And uh, thanks to my viewers for watching. Uh, maybe uh, if we have uh, further uh, questions that maybe people have about this conversation, maybe we can do a follow-up uh, a follow-up interview uh, down the road if you guys are open, open sure, to that. And uh, maybe your computer will be better. But this is great. This is great, though, actually having the two of you side by side like this. It's, it's uh, sort of a mix of like reality and then virtual, you know, it's uh... that's that's right. And Aaron, I got to say, your beard's rocking, man. That's a rocking beard. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and we're, since we're talking Plato and Plotinus, I always say that my, uh, my beard is has got an exitus radius scheme going in the sense that it, it goes out and then I shave it off and it goes out and, I, and it returns. <laughs> So my beard is in a platonic world, in the platonic stream. All right. Hey, th on that note, thank you guys, and uh, thanks for everyone for watching. Bye. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Thanks.